Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Sunday night we go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and we pick things up in Hebrews chapter 4 tonight, verse 14. And some of you might have thought, what an abrupt place to stop. Verse 13, you were bracing for a further 15 minutes, knowing I'd already gone the full hour, and, uh, but I surprised you, getting uh, smart in my old age. But anyway, there, I did stop at, at verse 13, prior to verse 14, because there really is a break there. And, and we're very thankful for uh, the chapter breaks and the verse breaks in the Bible, but uh, they make it easy for us to be able to say, turn to Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verse uh, 14, and we can all find ourselves at the same place. And, uh, but they are, those are man-made additions, and sometimes where they broke the chapters off, uh, sometimes it's not always the greatest place, though I don't have any complaints about it. I would have mutilated the Bible if uh, it had been left to me. Now, in the first um, three to four chapters of the book of Hebrews, the Lord has established uh, the fact that Jesus is better. The, he's talking to uh, Hebrew Christians who have uh, uh, be, come to know the Lord, come to love the Lord and walk with him in these things. And, uh, but they have left a religious system in order to do that, and a religious system that had been largely redefined uh, away from God and uh, by their, their religious leaders. And so uh, what you've got this, uh, this whole word better that, that goes through the whole book of Hebrews, and the writer of the book of Hebrews has is, is basically told them, uh, listen, the Old Testament prophets, they were good, but Jesus is better. Then he moved on and talked about angels. Angels are good, but Jesus is better, superior. Then they, he went on and, and talked about Moses. Moses was good, no doubt about it. We don't believe anything other than Moses, but Jesus is better. And now in, in chapter 4, verse 14, he begins to talk about how Jesus is better than the Old Testament high High priest and Aaron would have been Aaron the brother of Moses was the first uh, high priest appointed by God and uh, and so he now begins to talk about how Jesus is a better high priest than Aaron ever could have been and was intended to be and better than any high priest that followed Aaron now you look at that and you may think this is interesting and for the most part we're Gentiles that is non-Jews here uh, tonight and you think that's interesting that he would uh, you know, address the high priest in, in this whole uh, thought progression that he's, he's involved in here. But I uh, remember that these Jewish Christians that are being attempted to, to leave Christ and go back to, uh, you know, the old things of, of Judaism, one of the things that they would have been asked by uh, their friends is, all right, you've given your life to Jesus. You believe that he's the Messiah, but uh, what, what about a high priest? And uh, the twofold function of the high priest in the Old, old Covenant was, number one, he represented God before the people. In, in a holy life and the handling of the scriptures and these things. Second function of a priest, that he represented the people then before God. He was kind of a mediator. And, and so he would represent the people before God in prayer and the offering of, of their sacrifices. And so they would come along and they would say, well, all right, you've given your life to the Lord Jesus, but where's your high priest? Where's your mediator? How do you have access to God? Who represents God to you? And, and then who represents you before uh, God Almighty? And, and, and they would be able to say, you know, our high priest, he, um, he has special robes and he burns incense and he offers sacrifices. And look at this big temple that we have and, and look at what, what, what you have and, and don't have. And, and remember now... This book was written prior to the destruction of Herod's temple. Herod's temple was absolutely majestic. Uh, Herod didn't build anything unless he made a big to-do out of it. So to walk up onto the Temple Mount area in Jerusalem and to see the temple, you'd be undone. That was the reason that, he, that Herod had made it so ornate. God had never intended that it would be that ornate from the outside on things. 
And, and, and so here you've got this incredible temple there, and then these priests with their robes and the smells and the bells and the whistles and the sights and the sounds and the pomp and the circumstance and all. And, and, and then this is a part of your historical background as a family, and they come to you and say, you've left this for that? And remember, the early church, they didn't meet in uh, big concrete buildings like this. Uh, nothing as beautiful as this. But the early church, they didn't meet in church buildings like this until the third century. The early church met in homes. So here, here they are. They, they've left all of this, and they're in a home fellowship. And they're singing some songs, and they're reading some verses from the Bible, and they're doing a little bit of teaching from the Bible, and people look at it and go, You left that? For this? Cuckoo. I mean, that just, it, it just didn't make any sense that you would do that. You left all the majesty and all the things that our high priest does at Herod's temple every single day to be engaged in this little thing over here. And, and there's the potential to stump the new Christian. Say, so, wow, what do I have? And so the writer of the book of Hebrews says, Let me tell you about your high priest. And when you know who your high priest is and what your high priest is in Christ, you will know that you are richer than anything anyone has of this variety and you will never be impressed by another priest for the rest of your life. And that's what he's going to do to bring forth the superiority of Jesus as a high priest over even the greatest of high priests in the history of of the nation of Israel. And so he begins that now in verse 14, seeing that we have a great high priest. Aaron was a good high priest. The high priests that were faithful to God through history, wonderful. They're good. But the high priest that we have, we have a great high priest. And one of the reasons that he's so great is that he has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. And so the high priest that we have, the reason, one of the reasons Jesus is superior is that, first of all, he's in heaven and they aren't. He he operates in his function as the high priest from the vantage point of heaven and and not from earth. In other words, Jesus as a high priest has an access that no other high priest has ever had. The closest that the high priest in, in the old economy got to God was on one day out of the year, on the Day of Atonement. He was able, only after offering a sacrifice for his own sin, Only then was he able to enter into the Holy of Holies one day out of the entire calendar year. And only one man could do it, the high priest. And the Holy of Holies was a model of the heavenly scene. Our high priest isn't even operating in the context of a model. He's in the glory of heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father. And he pleads our case directly to the Father. Every single one of us that knows the Lord. I get excited about it, I'm telling you. Every single one of us, no matter who we are, that knows the Lord, every single one of us has a friend in high places. In high place. In heaven. When John writes his, his first epistle in chapter 2, verse 1, he speaks of Jesus as the advocate. He says, you know, brethren, I... I would that that we didn't sin, in essence. But he said, if we do sin, we have an advocate with a father. Someone who is an advocate for us, really a defense lawyer in in heaven for us. And, And here is Jesus when we fall short and when we fail. And one of the functions of the high priest was, you know, in the old economy, if we'd fail, we'd say, all right, go get another sheep. This is going to wipe us out, you know, and take it down to the temple and they'd offer it and, and the whole thing. And, and I mean, the whole big deal that was involved in the forgiveness of sin to drive home the point 
that, uh, that the seriousness of sin, it, it, took, it took a life in order to cover a sin. The life of an animal took the life of God uh, and, and his life and blood being shed in order to provide us with the forgiveness of sin. And, and so here we have, we don't, when I sin, I don't have to go try and find a sheep farmer somewhere and get a sheep and take it and sacrifice and everything. What do I get to do? I get to be just to stop no matter where I am. I can be driving in a car. I can be in a place like this. I can be at home. I can be walking down the street and say, Lord, I missed it there. I missed it. And I sinned there. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin there and help me to learn from this. And I want to handle that different the next time that I find myself in that place. And do you know why I get to have that clean and that simple of a relationship with God? Because of my high priest. Because I have a friend as a high priest. And so do you. So, Aaron, wonderful. But Jesus is a superior high priest. I mean, what else could you want in a high priest except that, that he is right there in heaven and has an access that, that, um, with God that no man could ever have? Why would you, in the writer of the book of Hebrews, is saying, why would you leave this high priest and go back to some descendant of, of Aaron? And, and that's, the, that's the point that he's making. And, and for this reason alone, he declares to him, let us hold fast our confession. Now notice in, in verse 14, the, the, the second reason that Jesus is, is better than, uh, is a high priest than Aaron, he, he's described as Jesus, the Son of God. That could never be said of a high priest in the Old Covenant. That's, that's a, 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 a wonderful thing. And then, and then he goes on and declares in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was sinless. That's a claim that no uh, ironic high priest could, could ever make concerning himself. So in, in uh, Jesus in taking on the human flesh, he can sympathize with our weaknesses. He, under, he understands what we face in, in the form of temptation, what we face in the, in the form of, of difficulty in this fallen world. So the old, the old Testament high priest could sympathize with us because he was sinful, he fell short, he knew what it was to be a human being on, on, a, on the fallen planet. But Jesus uh, understood all about what it was like to, to be a man, the perfect God-man in the world. To be a man, he understood all we went through, he faced all the temptations that we faced, but, but unlike anybody else, he was, he was sinless. Well, to be a high priest that was sinless, that relieved you of considerable distraction in your responsibilities. You could give your complete focus to who you are a high priest for. And that's what Jesus is able to do in, in the fact that he's sinless. Now notice in verse 16 as he continues to talk about that, Therefore, because of our high priest... Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The fourth reason that Jesus is a superior high priest is that he provides us with a continual access to the throne of God. The Aaronic high priest could not do that. He has given us a privilege as partakers uh, we're not even we're not even the high priest we just partake of the advantages of having him as our high priest we have privileges by virtue of having him as our high priest that no high priest in the old covenant had at all we have continual access to god we have the privilege of going to god on our own no lambs, no sacrifices, no special temple, no special place. I can go to God any time, day or night. An unbelievable access. Now, here's what happens. Here we are. Sometimes we're raised in church or, you know, we walk with the Lord for a while and it's like blah, 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 because that's all we've ever known. All we have ever known is this unbelievable privilege that is 
hours. But for the Jewish mind, he's exploding in his brain as all this is going out. Because for him to come, he's got to get the lamb and then the sacrifices and then he's got to get there and then the high priest and this and all of these things just to have his sin covered for a time till he commits the next sin. And, and when he hears about a high priest that gives you access any time to God in a personal relationship with him, I mean, they, they, they wouldn't have taken that for granted. That would have been amazing to them. I'll tell you, it's amazing to me. And, and notice, because of the high priest that we have, we can come, he says there in verse 16, boldly to the throne of grace. And I always think in that verse, you ever watch The Wizard of Oz? Shame on you. Just kidding. But that scarecrow, when he comes in at the end, you know, and he's all, everything, you know. And, that, and, it's, and sometimes people are like that, and even as Christians, in a relationship with the Lord, you know, and everything. God says, because of our high priest, not because of what we are or we aren't, because of our high priest, we can come boldly before the throne. doesn't mean impolite or rash or yo, yo, you know, or anything like that. But to, to come in, we have access to come boldly bef- before Him. And, and we can come at, at, at any time. Now, the people in the Old Testament, they couldn't draw uh, near, near to Him. Only the high priest could draw near to God. And only, again, He could only do that one day out of, of the year. And here is a high priest that gives us access to God Access to the, not just a model of the Holy of Holies, but access to heaven itself any time, all the time, day or night. What a high priest we have. And, and, and so, um, you know, it, this marvelous thing that would have really impressed them so much. And, and then not only are we able to come boldly uh, to the throne of grace, but when we come to the throne of, of grace... It's always uh, to receive mercy and grace and help. Something no high priest could do in that way for his, for his fellow man. Always when, because of our high priest, not because of myself, or my own righteousness or any of those things. Because we have the high priest that we have, we not only can come be boldly to the throne of God to talk with him and gain an audience with him, drum roll to have an audience with God (laughs) but every time we do he's there to dispense grace to me and mercy to me and help me in my time of need that's quite a throne isn't it now if I were summoned to appear before the Queen of England we're really talking hypothetically here aren't we but if I was summoned to appear before the Queen of England as she sat upon the throne. I'd be a wreck f- until it was over. I got a call and they, you know, and, and they said, hey, listen, uh, the Queen wants to have, a, you, you can have an audience with her in uh, May 7th. I'd be a wreck until May 8th. How do I, I, don't know, I hardly know how to curtsy and, and do all of these things and, and or how do I conduct myself and, and, and the only reason she would call me is I must be in terrible trouble and, and all. And, and the, you think about the intimidation of human thrones. You've got the throne of God. Because of our faith in Jesus, we have access to that throne. Any time. And, and we can go there without hesitation. And I just, I, for me, I know you're the same way. I just go through life and I don't stop and think, okay, um, do I, okay, God, and the curtsy, and I got kneel right here, and, and all, I, just, I just start to talk to Him. Lord, I don't understand. I can't see. What am I supposed to do here on this, Lord? And Lord, I love you, and you've been so good to me. I can't believe it how good you've been. And, and, and just, no, so relaxed. And comfortable before the throne of God. Why? Because the high priest we have. And Aaron, he's good as the high priest. But he's nothing like the one that we have. And, and, and so this is the, the privilege that, that we have. And, and why, why can I 
go before this throne and, and that way because Jesus has made the God who sits on that throne my Father. So I can go into that room like a kid can go into his father's room and start to talk with him and that, that, kind, of, that kind of comfort. So, you know, that's the kind of boldness that we have because this is our high priest. Now, what kind of boldness could you have to go before the throne of God if, if, it's, if going before the throne of God is based upon works or law? There'd be no boldness, would there? Don't, don't kill me! Don't kill, I, I gotta, but I've got to talk to you! But I, you know, I know you're going to squash me like a bug because I'm coming on my own righteousness and works. But I had a pretty good morning, so I thought I'd take a shot at it. <laughs> I mean, there, you'd never want to go before the throne, much less think you could go boldly. I tell you, it's tremendous, really tremendous what is, what is ours and how wise God has been and the way that he has, has saved us. And, and he continues this whole thing, the superiority of Jesus as the high priest, as he heads into chapter 5. For every high priest, talking about purely human high priest, taken from a men, among men, and, and that's uh, the high priest was always taken from among men, is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And, and so... The um, verse two, he can. Uh, this priest can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And and so Jesus is superior to the any high priest or the Aaronic high priest because he doesn't have to offer a sacrifice for his own sin as every other high priest had to. And you notice that the high priest was taken among men. God, though, though um, the, the, the high priests were sinners themselves, God graciously allowed them the privilege of assisting their fellow man in, in this way. And, and then you notice, very important in verse 1, that the high priest was anointed, uh, appointed rather for men to offer both gifts and sacrifices for us. They were appointed for the purpose of assisting us in our relationship with God. And because of the high priest's humanity, he had a compassion on his fellow man as he fulfilled the function. No, no human high priest was to see him better than anyone else that he was serving because he wasn't. In his humanity, he faced all of the problems everyone else did. He sinned just like everyone else did. And so the high priests, they, they were men. And as a result of it, and as a result of the fact that they sinned like everyone else, they had a compassion upon their fellow man. And they realized, I am human, and because I am human, I ought to be humane to my fellow man. And you say, what could be better than that? Jesus, as the high priest... Because all of that was good, the only way th that that could be better than, uh, than what w it was under Aaron was to have God have that same compassion upon us. Jesus comes in human flesh, faces all that we face, and, and has a tremendous compassion upon us. You think about that. I don't know how you kind of we view God, you know, we kind of grow in, in these things as we, as we walk with the Lord. Do you realize as a high priest, he has compassion on you? He has compassion on you. He looks at what, he, he looks at you and here you are. You're, you're endeavoring the best that you can, we are, to walk with him. It's a fallen world. We go against the stream of the world to do that. We face temptations, we face hardship, we face persecution, we face isolation and, and shunning sometimes for our faith and all of these kinds of things. And, and, and Jesus takes and he looks at us and, and having faced all of that himself, he has, he has compassion upon us. So I understand exactly where they are. I understand exactly where they are. I have compassion upon them. 
is they're trying to live for me in this fallen world. Isn't that great to think about the Lord in those terms? Instead of making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty at night. You know, oh, there you go. Kyle gets cold again. You know, that kind of But when you really stop and think, he knows I'm trying. And, and he has compassion on me as, as I'm, I'm trying to grow like, like the Lord and, and you too. So, so here, here's this tremendous, great advantage in that we have uh, a high priest who has uh, the same compassion as the other high priests had, but he is superior in, in who he is in having that compassion uh, up, upon us. And, and so here this, these uh, Aaronic high priests, you know, they had to offer sacrifices for their own sin on the Day of Atonement before they could go in to the Holy of Holies and, and offer the sacrifice for the people and all. They had to offer a sacrifice for their own sin, and Jesus never has to do that. Now notice in verse 4, And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God just as Aaron was. So the high priest was not self-appointed. The high priest was never self-appointed, not as it was. It became corrupted, and it was in Jesus' time. That was a corruption of, 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 of the Old Testament. God intended that the high priest was never to be self-appointed, but to be called by God as the high priest. When Aaron was, Aaron was the first high priest, the brother of Moses, why was he the first high priest? Because God chose him to be the first high priest. And, and God the Father has appointed Jesus as the high priest. In other words, what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying is, God was free to choose whether he would allow himself to even be approached by man, and, and, and he was free to choose who he would allow to approach him on behalf of man, And when he chose Aaron from among the Jews, there was no complaint concerning God's choice. And and, and and he has now chosen Jesus for that position in even a greater way. And likewise, there should be no complaint. So if, if someone objected and said, wait a second, who made Jesus high priest? Then the writer is in essence saying, God did. And remember, this is not without precedence in your history. He chose Aaron as the high priest. He can choose Jesus as the high priest. He can choose whoever he wants as the high priest. He's putting a lot of things in place for these Jewish minds and Jewish way that things are being looked at. And then, then notice there in, in, in verse 5, but uh, so also Christ did not g- glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he, the Father, who said uh, to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And, and here, is, here is another thing that makes Jesus appear as a high priest. He is the Son of God something that no other high priest could, could ever claim. That's a tremendous credential. All right, look at that goofy home fellowship you're attending. What kind of a high priest you got? Son of God. <laughs> huh, buckaroo? What do you got down there? How much incense can you light to make up for that, huh? Get a little carried away on things here related to that. And, and so here this temptation to pull them, pull them away and all. And, that, and that's the truth. You know, you go anywhere. It's one of the great things about being at home here in Modesto or one of the surrounding cities or being someplace else in the United States and gathering together where people are, are worshiping or to be on the other side of the world and, and come together where Christians are coming together. And I, I've been in, in India a few times and you're just in, it's just the tropics down in the southern section of it. And you've got these thatched roofs and, the, and there's no walls because you, you want the air to blow through and all. I mean, there's no, once the people leave that room, I mean, it's, it's just a big hut. Looks, I mean, the value of it's probably $400. Concrete floor and some, and some wood on the side to hold up the roof and that's it. But, but they, you get together. 
And the high priest is with us. And there's nothing in all of the world that compares to that. Ah, how rich uh, uh, we are. And so that's, that's the credential that, that he, he has. And then notice there in verse 6, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is superior in that he is a priest forever. Old Testament priests, they were priests as long as they lived. They died. You need a new high priest. And, and Jesus is a high priest forever and ever. For those of you who have trouble with names or remembering, who's the high priest now? This is wonderful uh, for us. And all never changes. He will always hold that position And then he says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with vehement uh, cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus is the superior high priest because he is the author of eternal salvation. And no other high priest could offer that or can offer that to man. He's the author of eternal salvation. He's unique in that he provides that. Not just the covering of sin through the offering of sacrifices, but the washing away of sin and then eternal salvation. And so the old high priest, they could point people to God. That was great. Jesus has made a way for God the Holy Spirit to actually come into our lives and indwell us. Now it is interesting where he talks about verse 9 concerning Jesus, and having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who believe him. Sometimes we think, well, was Jesus imperfect and and he had to be made uh, perfect here and all? It doesn't mean that Jesus wasn't perfect, but that it was through his suffering that he became perfected as our Savior. He could not be our Savior apart from his suffering and his death upon the cross. And, and so he couldn't have, have become our Savior without experiencing that suffering. And, and I think it's wonderful. I, it's, it's humbling in verse 7 where the writer describes the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion. I, I just, I'm in awe of the fact that Jesus would die on the cross for my sins. I'm in awe of the fact as I've said many times before, that he would even come into the world. But you know those pictures in the gospel that describe Jesus on the night before the cross? He said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. Father, if there is any other way, for man to be saved, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You look all the way through the Gospels. Fearless. In the face of multitudes, in the face of religious leaders that would have torn him from limb to limb, if he was not supernaturally protected and his days numbered by day, has the, my hour has not yet come. And yet he comes to face that cross and to bear my sin and your sin and the sin of the world on that cross. And it's the one time he says to the Father, let's just make sure if there's any other way let this cup pass from me. And and there he is, he's praying, he's sweating from his brow, as it were, great drops of blood to the ground. The disciples are all asleep. It's just him and the Father and and all of it. 
It's really super, super heavy ground. The Garden of Gethsemane is where all this takes place. The word Gethsemane, it means olive press. It's where they press the olives to squeeze the olive oil out of the olives. And in that place, Jesus is being pressed by the, what he's facing the next day upon the cross. He's being pressed in there till the, the sweat is coming out of his brow like drops of blood, maybe even as drops of blood, the agony that he's going through. I think what the writer of the book of Hebrews is doing is he's just reminding them uh, and, and, and saying to these Hebrews, I know you're paying a price. I'm not minimizing the price that you're paying to stay faithful to Christ. But while you're in the middle of it, never ever forget the price that he paid for you to have that privilege. The price that he was willing to bear in that garden, and then ultimately upon that cross in order that you might be saved and you might be forgiven. We can turn all internal, can't we, on things. And so the little boy in this, and then our eyes get turned to the Lord. So, all right, you're right. What am I thinking? What am I thinking on things? So he's trying to re- regain perspective here in in their in their lives. And so, it, it, you know, the, the price that was paid in order that Jesus paid in order that he might become the author of eternal salvation, called, verse 10, by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Jewish, uh, these Jewish believers, they would have... Um, had surely had someone uh, come up to them and say, wait a second, Jesus can't be your high priest. He's from the tribe of Judah. The priests are Levites. How can he be uh, your high priest? He's not even from the priestly tribe. The writer of the book of Hebrews, oh, so yes, he is. He's from a priestly order. He's from the order of Melchizedek. And that's a priesthood of one. And he's going to go into all of that in, in chapter 7 through 10 to detail all of all of those things uh, out and and so here is um, uh, you know all of this that it, uh, uh, that the questions that they would have had and the answers that the writer comes with it called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek who of whom we have much to say that is of the priesthood of Melchizedek and hard to explain and I would say Oh boy, Uh, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers of these things, the idea is you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so here he uh, pauses, and this is the way the writer of the book of Hebrews does it all the way through. He lays down this incredible case, then he heads into an exhortation to... uh, uh, you know, address, you know, some subject related to these believers. And, and so here he pauses in his whole train of thought to address the subject of their spiritual dullness, as he, he calls it in verse 11. They had become dull of, of hearing. And they'd been Christians long enough, he, he is saying to them, you've been Christians long enough that you shouldn't need this kind of encouragement to stay faithful to the Lord. You've been a Christian long enough to be encouraging other people who, to stay faithful to the Lord who are genuine babes in Christ because they've just come to know the Lord. And, and so he's, and there, is, there is that kind of a situation that you can run into even today where someone has known the Lord for such a long, long time and you're just always having to prop them up. 
God's forgiven you. You're going to heaven. Come on, you know, and all this kind of, and uh, this, all these different things, and, and it, it's just, it's, it's not good to know the Lord for 20 years and still have needing this kind of encouragement to, to keep going uh, on, on things. And, and so the reason that they're being pulled away, the way that they're being pulled away is, is because they lacked a biblical foundation in their life. And they lacked a biblical foundation in their life, not because it wasn't available to them, but, they, but because they didn't avail themselves uh, of it. They, they had chosen not to grow deep in their knowledge of the Word of God and thus deep in God, so they needed these constant in, encouragements in, in their uh, walk with the Lord. And people are very vulnerable to false doctrine and being pulled back into the old ways like they were because they don't know their, their Bibles. Not to know the Bible is to be vulnerable really to believing anything to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine as paul uh, declared to to the ephesians and so each of us we need to keep growing and deeper and deeper in our knowledge of god's word it protects us it protects us until his voice is more important to me and louder to me than any other voice in the world even the voice of my family, the voice of my friends, the voice of my peers, the voice of the people that I used to run in, in religious circles or not in religious circles. And they had not yet given God's voice that kind of place in their life. That's why they were listening to these other voices that were telling them, come back to the old ways. They, they hadn't. That they hadn't given the word that kind of place. And, and so he, he says in terms of their doctrinal uh, foundations, they're like babies. And so in the same way that a baby needs to have milk, it can't handle solid food. Isn't it great, moms, when the day comes and they can finally start to have those strained peas? I think that basically that's how we get rid of our peas. Um, <laughs> We feed them to babies and stuff. I mean, if you like them, that's, I like them too and everything like that. I'm, still, I'm, I'm holding the line, though, on those lima beans and Brussels sprouts. I'm not getting those two vegetables at all. So the people say, no, you, gotta, you just put garlic and you put some onions on it, and, and then you throw in a, 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 a cube of butter, you know, to get the th- Well, so I'll, uh, so I'll eat a cube of butter. Can you leave the lima beans out? I'll have. I'll, I'll use my cube of butter on some hot chocolate chip cookies. You use yours on your lima beans. And and all. Where, what am I talking about here? I got to look down in my Bible on this. So ah, oh, there we go. So, they, but it's a wonderful time. There's nothing wrong, is it, with nursing a baby or giving milk to a baby as long as they're a baby? Nobody holds that against the baby. But, wow, now we get to f- feed them regular food and all, and, and, and how wonderful it is for them to cross uh, through that, through that th- uh, threshold. And in and, uh, and the same way that a baby has to have milk because they can't handle solid food, a person can be a spiritual baby because they, they can't handle solid, you know, meaty teaching of, of, of the Word of God and of, of doctrine. Spiritual maturity is not marked by years or time and title. We used to talk about at the phone company. What's your time and title? So, spiritual maturity it is based upon how much of the Word of God I know, how much I'm applying to my life and obeying, and then the authority that God's Word has in my life for my thinking, for my decision making, how I live my life. That defines a mature Christian. And a person can walk with the Lord, or know the Lord rather, for 20 years and be way behind someone that has known the Lord only for 18 months. But they're going for it. So it's, it's not amount of time. It's, it's these other things. They'd known the Lord for a while, but he's still, he's still calling them babies because of their lack of knowledge of the Word of God, and, and they, they're not giving the Word of God its proper uh, in respectful place in, in, in their lives. And so he says that the immature Christian, notice, is one who is unskilled in the Word of Righteousness. They, they, they are, they, they're unskilled in their knowledge of the Word of God. And they don't allow the Word of God to fashion their thinking. 
and their decision making. And then notice the mature Christian, he says there, is one who uses the Bible to discern both good and evil. The Word of God is the single greatest influence in their life. And they define good and evil, right and wrong, what they should do, not do, how they should live by the Word of God. That's a mature Christian. That's how maturity is is, uh, uh, defined in the Word of God. So God's Word says it. That settles it. And and there's no argument in here with me. That is is the way that right and wrong is defined. I'm not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I'm not to lie. I'm not to steal. Self-righteousness is as a filthy rag. I cannot become righteous through my own religious works. Those are the things, those are the the beliefs and, and thinking that characterize a mature Christian. Why? Because that's what the Bible teaches. And these, and these Hebrew believers, they're wavering because they don't know their Bibles uh, very well. And, and because the Bible hasn't been given that authoritative place uh, in their life. Now, it's okay to be a baby Christian, uh, isn't it? When you're a, a new Christian, we expect a new Christian to be a baby. But it's, uh, it's not good for a person to remain as a baby when they get much older. And the classic illustration, it's kind of gross, isn't it? You know, you got a little baby who's <laughs> six weeks old and they're in the crib and you go into the nursery and you look. Oh, she's beautiful. He's beautiful. Can't believe it. Doesn't look like either of you. And, uh, you know, so the whole thing and everything. And, and of course, that's appropriate. A little baby in a crib and the little nucky and the whole, you know, the whole deal. Come back 18 years. Come in. I want you to see Howard. And you go into his room and there he is, this gigantic six foot six, 260 pounds with a little nucky in his mouth and the whole deal and the diaper and the whole baby Huey thing. It'd be, it would be, uh, I mean, we laugh, but it'd be heartbreaking. Now you, you, you move from the illustration, which is silly, of course, but what, what if it's true and needlessly so? I'm not talking about a developmental problem in a child or something like that. We're talking about the fact that that does not need to be the case. You walk into the room and what happens? Oh, your whole heart sinks. That is tragic. And, and the Lord looks at our lives as Christians. No guilt, but I mean this is, this is the way that it is. And for a person to be 18 years old in the Lord and still at the six-week stage, heaven looks at it as tragic. That's, a sad, that's one of the saddest things in the whole world as they look at it. And, and that's, that's the place they're staying there as, as babes. And then in verses 1 through 3, and we'll close with these tonight. Wow, I dodged a bullet. We might get raptured this week, and I won't have to go into verse 4. Uh, through six but anyway so here he he begins in these first three verses of of uh, chapter six he follows his thought therefore leaving the discussion of the elemental or the basic principles of christ let's go on to perfection or maturity let's not stay babies not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So he says, let's not go back and keep talking about all of the basic things. And all of these, these topics that he describes here are the things that you tell a non-Christian when they're investigating. These are the things that mark a person who looks at it and says, I agree with those things, and now I'm giving my life to the Lord, and they've just gone right over the threshold into the family. These are like the basics that you have to have to be a Christian, and then, but they haven't moved any further from it. So he, he talks about here the, the basics. Let's move from these basics. Repentance, he says, from God works, uh, from dead works, rather. Repentance from religious works as a way of being saved. So that you, you, are, you already, to become a Christian, you already crunched this one. 
Why are we coming back now later and having to address the same thing? You already know that you can't be saved through, through dead works and of faith in God and, and the, the realization that one is saved through, through faith in God and not through dead works of the, the doctrine of baptisms and talking, we talk about water baptism and what it represents and the old life and God raising us up out of that, you know, dead in our sins, the grave, into a new life and all of these things and, and all that it represents about our conversion and a new creation and all of these things, the laying on of hands, you know, related to the Holy Spirit of resurrection from the dead and, and the fact that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead and that everybody's going to stand before the Lord and give an account for their life. Um, the uh, unbeliever will uh, do that before the white throne judgment and the Christian will do that before the Bema seat of Christ. They're going to give an, we're going to give an account for our faithfulness. Not heaven and hell isn't at stake for the child of God, but for our faithfulness to the ministry that that God has called us to. So this whole uh, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, that there's an eternity, that there's a heaven, that there's a hell, and everybody's going to end up in one of those two places based upon what they do with Christ. Those are all things that, that uh, these are all, you, you take those six things and they all make up an evangelistic sermon. And, and so he's saying, we're, we're still talking to you like we're talking to people that don't know the Lord or have just come into the kingdom. Come on, let's go on to maturity. And, and he said, and this we will do, address these things if, if God permits. And, and so we stop there in, in, in that place and then uh, we'll pick things up, Lord willing, in verse 4 um, next week. What a high priest. I've said a lot of words tonight, haven't I? Don't agree too readily, but I did. I said a lot of things. But they all represent, all those words represent a reality about God and about our high priest. They're not just words. We just stop and when we think about who Christ is, uniquely who He is, and then what He was willing to do for us because He loves us in order to save us. And, and, and the point again that He's making here is when we really know who He is and what He is, we will never be impressed with any other priest in, in life. It is a protection of ever being pulled away from Him. And to just stop tonight, all those things that we look through, and to stop and look and say, Lord, I celebrate you tonight for who you uniquely are and what you have brought into my life because of who you are. And Lord, if I don't have two quarters to rub together tonight, I count myself the richest person in the world, if for no other reason, because you're my high priest. How blessed we are and how rich we are. I'd sure like the worship team to come forward.